Um, I became a friend of uh, Ray Kelvin, the crap man closest to Ted. And uh, when I hit 60, he asked me what I was going to do, um, if I'm going to carry on teaching, which I could have done. And he said, if you decide not to, uh, why don't you come and uh, work for me and be a historian in residence at Ted? And I said, what would my brief be? And he said, well, um, he said, I'd like you to do a monthly lecture, and that could be on any topic you want, you choose. Um, but it's got to get people thinking out of the building, and it may inspire them, it may make them think twice about issues, it may be political. So this afternoon, um, this morning, I did um, lectures to the Pembroke head office about the post Brexit situation, for example. I know one or two people from here came to the Brexit one before the vote. So we do those sorts of things as well. Um, but also, I'm there as a resource, so that designers can come to me, they can talk to me about, hi, come in, hi. Um, they can talk to me about uh, projects that they've got ongoing, and I'm gonna show you one of those in a minute, and I'll see if I can help in, in any way. But the other thing that Ray said to me is that he wanted me to encourage people to think outside of our building as much as possible and to think away from the screen. And again, one of the things that we've done in the office is we've, we've started a reading group, for example, and to get people not just looking at screens, but actually looking at getting inspired by the print of word and by um, design books because they feel different. The way that your brain works with them is different. So. so We've called this Inspired Design, and it's, a, it's really a little sort of uh, look at kind of what, what I do and some of the things that sort of Ted's taught me as well. When you're talking about inspiration, um, there's this kind of idea that the next slide sort of sums it up, really, is that suddenly, suddenly there's a eureka moment that you get this idea, and it just comes from nowhere, and suddenly everything clears, the mist is clear. Um, some years ago, um, Sir Alec Jeffries, who was the guy that discovered genetic fingerprinting, uh, came to a lecture for me when I was a deputy head of the school, and uh, he talked about the day, the morning, they realized they cracked the, the code for genetic fingerprinting. And it was 8.45, I think, in the morning, and he said suddenly it was a eureka moment. But of course, behind that eureka moment was probably two decades of work. So it wasn't just the moment happened, but it was based on huge amounts of research and so forth. And we love um, uh, this Jack London quote as well, with the idea you can't wait for inspiration, you have to go after it with a club. And Jack London was an author who lived his stories. He was a man who didn't write about things. If he was going to write about something, he went and lived it. He was a really adventurous soul. He was a wonderful photograph of him here, which sort of sums that up. So the idea that that Eureka moment just happens without you having to do anything is something that clearly we don't believe and that's just isn't the case. We're very um, interested in and inspired by William Morris. Um, our boss loves William Morris, he loves the story of William Morris, he loves the fact that William Morris was an artisan, was somebody who loved working with his hands, and he loves the fact that William Morris was somebody who was um, interested in selling things to people, to making people's lives brighter through things they purchased, but also that he was a man who was interested in diversification. And we're better to talk about that than being here today, you know, having partners. And William Morris is, is fantastic for that, of course. And so one of the things we do, we look at all of the aspects of William Morris's work and his politics, which are also very interesting. And we, we've studied William Morris, we've looked at it in great detail, and, as I say, we look at the fact that he was a man who diversified. But he was a man who understood what it was to be inspired. Now, that inspiration came about for him because, as I'm sure you'll know, he kept his eyes open all the time, whether it was sitting and looking at his garden while he was having his breakfast, we'll see an example of that in a minute, or whether it was researching in the museums in South Kensington and being inspired by Persian art or Indian art. And he didn't copy it. He was inspired by it. And the term that he and we use is that he reimagined designs. So that he looked at designs and he reimagined them for a new audience, for a new age. 
And this is one example. This is Trellis um, from his house in Bexley. And it's Trellis with roses growing up it. And this is a half finished um, uh, study for Trellis. And we love this um, design and we love it so much that it was an inspiration for us. And again, it's not copy, but there is secret trellis, and there is secret trellis. So it's clearly inspired by William Morris, but it is not just a pastiche or a copy of William Morris. And so we're very keen to do that. We'll look at design movements, we'll look at designers and artists, and we will be inspired by them. And again, another thing that we like about William Morris is this very famous quote of his, having nothing in your house that you're not going to be useful or believed to be useful. Just because something is, is, is useful and has utility doesn't mean it cannot be very useful in its own right. Indeed, it could be a work of art in its own right. We'll come back to that um, a little bit later on. There's another quote from an artist that we like very much indeed. Um, which actually sort of seems to say something different to this. And I want to, we have the temerity to sort of challenge it. And that is David Hockney's famous quote, art has to move you and design does not, unless it's a good design for a bus. Now it's a smart quote, and it's quite funny I guess, but actually we fundamentally disagree with that. Because as with William Morris, we believe that great design can be like great art and that it can lift your spirits, and it can change the way people feel about themselves, about their day, about their environment. So we believe environment is critically important to well-being and to mental health. So we believe quite the opposite to this. So what we would say is, what about good design? Okay, bad design, maybe you're right, but what about good design? And so we look at the things that we get inspired by, what inspires us at tech. Nature inspires us. Keeping our eyes open, looking at nature, looking at botanical prints, uh, the fact we've got uh, bee colonies above us you know, has inspired some of our prints and so on. Place is important to us. So in, in all kinds of ways, not only in being inspired for the designs that we produce, but also for the way in which we sell things to people. We're all over the world. And so showing your respect for the place that you're in, um, it informs everything we do about our store design and about the way in which we train the teams within those stores. Stories. Stories can inspire you to create, um, to create great design. We'll see some of those in a minute. Tradition. Very, very important to us, as it is indeed to British ceramic tile. You can see their heritage wall here. Tradition is critically important and having a pride in the quality of uh, production and the quality of the materials that you're using. And just so that you're not kind of stuck in, again, just being a kind of a heritage pastiche type brand, that innovation is also critical. Innovation and diversification. So nature, obviously, for us, is something which informs a huge amount of what we do and informs our design, both for men and for women. And we're in the process at the moment of negotiating uh, with a major botanical garden for us to go in and to work with them and look at their archive and so forth. And that will, again, it will inspire our print designs. Place. And this is one of my favorite stories of my time at Tay. I'm doing some training with our team in Cheapside. And our Cheapside store is just there. I mean, it's that building somewhere and where it's been destroyed by bombs twice since that photograph was taken. But that's the position of it. And we were using this just to show how Cheapside looked in 1910, around about 1910. And then I was asked by the print designers, could I provide them with some original uh, Victorian fonts? Because they wanted to produce um, a design which had an alphabet or encyclopedia thing. And I had given this to our head of um, director of production. And he pulled me over and said, this is such a cool little car. And this car was a lottery car for St. Paul's Cathedral. And the idea of the car is that you buy a car for a penny, <coughs> you'll see that it's got a list underneath there, and the list is capital letters, and alongside those capital letters are flowers beginning with that letter. 
Okay? And the idea was you were supposed to put in order of which which are the most popular flowers in Britain, put them in that order. And then those people who agreed with the pattern, their cards would be put in a hat, pulled out, and if you won it, you would win a thousand pounds, which was a huge amount of money, and people were earning about a pound a week at the time. So it's a massive amount of money. And we looked at this, and I showed it to our pattern designers. And what they did with it is this. So that what you've got is rather than just having the alphabet letters, what you've got is the alphabet letters with the flowers growing around. And so one of the things we say is that inspiration can come from the most unexpected source. Who would have possibly imagined that a lottery ticket for St. Paul's Cathedral produced in 1910 could turn into that? And that's the dress from the same collection. And this is in our shops at the moment. And we call it now, we call it Encyclopedic Floral. Encyclopedic Floral. And the cheap side the staff call it the cheap side dress. <laughs> so, because they feel a sort of sense of ownership because it started with one of their training sessions. So, you can find inspiration in very unusual places you can see. One of the first <coughs> lectures I did when I went to Ted Baker was um, in a previous life, I was a military historian. Um, I've always been fascinated by the fact that people seem to really like military military fashions. And if you look at um, the new, new collections, which are in uh, Drakens this week, there's a hell of a lot of military stuff. The camouflage is back, folks. Um, did it ever go away? And the whole, I mean, camouflage being a fashion item is always interesting as well, because the whole idea of camouflage is that you can't be seen when you wear it. Whereas if you're wearing it as a fashion item, quite the opposite is the case, or the intention. So we do sequin camouflage suits for women and so forth. So I've, been, I've always been interested in it. This is a trench coat um, designed specifically for soldiers in the First World War. This young officer is wearing one. And uh, this is a design from Ted Baker called Trenchy, without the H. So obviously um, influenced by the First World War trench coat. It even had little hooks under the collar. Those little hooks would have originally been used for fastening your gaskets. So these little kind of heritage items are little connections with the past. But again, it's a reimagining of a style. This is nothing to do with utility other than keeping you dry, but it's certainly not to do with keeping your maps and a couple of hand grenades in, you know. So and it's been tailored in a very, very different way. And following on from we, um, we, we like Steve McQueen in the office. Um, we, are, we like him a lot. We think he's very cool. We think he wears clothes, war clothes so beautifully. And so you've got a, an unusual sort of mixture here. Steve McQueen we like, and here he is wearing a Second World War bomber jacket. So cool, because bomber pilots used to wear them. You might like to have a look at I have here the granddaddy of that bomber jacket. So this is what we do this thing about talking to the clothes and doing a who do you think you are type thing. Who's your grandfather? Well, if you are looking at any of you who've got bomber jackets, there's Grandpa. So this is a 1942 pattern urban jacket, and this is what would be worn by British pilots. They didn't have heating in their planes, so they look this is incredibly heavy. But you can see that there are lots of features that you might have on your bomber jacket, like the zip on the sleeve and so forth. So a lot of these things are replicated in the fashion item, a million miles away from the original use of the, of the clothing. And McQueen is wearing one of the lightweight American flight jackets, the bomber jackets. And why have I put um, Morris next to him? Well, one of the other things you can do with inspiration is you can have unusual sort of couplings of the points of inspiration. So I actually took this off, uh, this is Ted's story, this is from the uh, uh, head office at all. So here you have a bomber jacket. Notice you've got the zips on the sleeve, but inside of it, secret trucks. So again, it's a reimagining of the style. This is very similar to um, an American issue bomber jacket, but inside, Stephen Green most certainly would not have had um, such a, a line. But it's a fun way of reimagining the past. It gives a new life to um, an old design and also a new function. 
which brings us to tradition. Ted Baker has always been very interested in the excellence of tailoring, but also with surprising people with features and the detail, the quality of the detail. And if you, I mean, I'll take my jacket off to demonstrate. So, on the back of the collar, you have a melting vessel, which is obviously what gives the collar its shape. Most tailors, they would have just a plain, plain colour there. But with Ted Baker, one of the features is that you make as much of a fuss of the melting, which you never see it, as you do of the rest of the design. Also, our suits will have these surgeon's cuffs. So surgeon's cuffs were popular in the Crimean War, where surgeons would unbutton their suit jacket and then fold them up when they were at work. And again, here with the surgeon's cuff, you've got a repeat of the pattern that you've got on the melt. And the buttons are also different, as you can see. And the buttons are all natural as well, after the no plastic or anything like that used in the buttons. So these are little details that you know, have always been features of ten suits or jet and jackets and blazers. Why a fly? People are always asking me, why have you got that at the wedding at the weekend? Why have you got that in your buttonhole? Well, we like buttonholes a lot. Um, Prince Albert was the one who popularized buttonholes by making a buttonhole on the day of his wedding by actually getting a knife out and cutting a hole in his lapel and sticking a rose in it. Shows what an old romantic he was. Um, we have, each season we have different flies, we have different buttonholes that go in the jackets. So the special feature, but always there is a special line as well. And why have we got all this fishing related stuff? Well, the chief executive, the man closest to Ted, one of his favorite hobbies, he's just come back, is fly fishing. So it's his way of putting a signature, rather than signing it, the signature for him is calling this range of uh, blazers tight lines. And it's we then know that this is sort of Ray's imprint, if you like, on the brow, which, when I first met Ray, he asked me to go to his office. I was a debt at his bid school, and uh, the first thing he did, he was hugging and embarrassing, he was rather embarrassing, but other than that, he's big on hugging, other than that, he said, look, why don't you come and have a look at what I do in the office? I said, yeah, okay. So I went to the office, and uh, in a typical way, he sat me down and he said, right, we've got a problem, we want to design something for uh, one of our suits. The suit has got an Edwardian theme, and we are looking for a, a pattern design for the line. And they were thinking at one point about doing uh, Edwardian postcards, and they, when they did the uh, move towards the they hated it. And he, was, he sat down and he said, what would you do with this? And so, I, after 15 minutes, I sort of went and tapped on the shoulder and said, I think I've got an idea. And the idea I, I came up with on that day was using Edwardian call times. And the reason I did that was because A, they're beautiful, B, they're geometric, um, C, they can be put in any number of different color ways, and you can play around with them with a beat head and like that. So I suspect that's probably why after what I was going to do when I left teaching. But this is no longer produced. This is, I'm going to drag this out of archive. But it was another way of, you know, you got a teacher in randomly for the day, and you just say, well, you think we should use for our linings. And again, it's looking around all the time, looking not only at what's around you, but also who's around you. And, you know, in what way can they sort of uh, add value? If you look at innovation, again, it's appropriate that we've got the, now these tiles are both primitive and textured. That's the, the uh, innovation. Yes, because it's um, the partners we have a piece of tea, this sort of beautiful um, design here. And what makes this different is that we, with our partners, have looked ahead and said, let's do something slightly different. And the fact that we're working with the tile company is obviously different as well for us. We've also got a new active wear range, and with that, not only are we looking at different ways of decorating that active wear range, but we're actually looking at new technologies um, as far as the fabrics are concerned as well. 
And then on a more traditional level, we've got a wonderful publisher called Merry, um, that Merry and the wonderful uh, design that they did in the 60s and 70s called Totem, <coughs> which we, when it was originally produced, had a kind of impressed um, pattern on the outside of it. Um, the pattern went, and then we put florals on top of it so that they perfectly complemented um, the um, our fashion designs. Um, that was great. When we're talking to our store teams, one of the things we say to them is, look, clothes, clothes are a thing of beauty. Our designs are a thing of beauty. And that's true about you know, all of the departments we work with as well. The things we produce are beautiful in their own right. So again, we're saying that Hockney's quote, we just don't think it's true. So one of the things we begin to challenge to our stores worldwide, and we said, we want you to turn Ted designs into art. So a lot of them are inspired by art. We want you to turn them back into art. So this is um, produced by our Tokyo store. I love this one. This is Utrecht. And it was a way of um, uh, promoting a new handbag design. So the only thing there is the text, the handbag. But we really love that. This, remember, this is, these are the sales teams producing this. This is not head office. This is our Sheffield store. Um, with a variety of tech products there that we get, we love that. Paris. So it's again looking at the designs in a slightly different way and engaging with the, the beauty of the design. This is Huddersfield. So this is our Huddersfield design, which we think you know, for a mill town, we thought this was a pretty cool thing that they came up with here. And I mean, we just love that. It is wonderful. And of course, in so many ways, the store teams are looking at our product in a different way, they're engaging with it in a personal way, and they are reimagining the product and turning it into a beautiful work of art. One of the other things we do is we play with them, we play with the store teams, and we gave them a challenge with the 400th anniversary of um, Shakespeare's death, and we said, right, we want you to take 10 products of any kind, and we want you to set them in scenes from Shakespeare. So we had just under a hundred um, entries for competition. We, we bought a, a pretty awful model of Shakespeare, which they competed for. And this was the winner from uh, Selfridges of Manchester, obviously from uh, Green. And we love this one as well. This is from Fulton Hills in the States. Uh, it was a, a rather unusual take on uh, Hamlet. So we, again, they had a lot of fun doing it, and it's another way of reimagining the product. I was in an art gallery um, about uh, six weeks ago, and I saw this painting. And because we're always looking, we're always thinking about the business and inspiration, and I saw this painting by an artist called Kathy Strauss, and photographed it and I sent it to Ray and I said, Ray, this is King's Cross in 1960 and our office is just behind us. And this, of course, this is the time when the gas were there, this is one of the roughest parts of London. I said, this is such a cool painting. Shall we buy it? And he said, buy it and research it. So I bought it and I researched it. And then the research took me on a totally different journey, which we then brought back into the business. The reason for that is that Kathy Strenitz was one of what they called the kinder transport children from the period just before the Second World War. One of the Jewish children who were brought out of um, uh, what came occupied Europe and were put with foster families in the late 30s. And Kathy Strenitz was one of the oldest of those. She was 16 and already quite a gifted artist. And she went on to uh, work as an artist with a lot of success, and particularly in our area. But because I started looking at her, I began to look at everybody else that was on the kinder transport with her. And there were an amazing group of people, film producers, more artists, leaders of business, members of the House of Lords, quite an extraordinary group of people. And the one that we love the best is an avant-garde artist called Gustav Metzger. And Gustav Metzger is a man who was deeply troubled by um, his experiences he had. Um, he 
is a man who is stateless, so that he lives in Britain. He refuses to have the nationality of any country because of what he saw happen to his family. And this piece of art was produced for the Serpentine in 2012, and it's called Flaming Trees. And we went down this route looking at all these people and the things that they gave to society and the messages that they left behind when the Mexicans still alive. And one of the things he said was, artists, and with this we would say designers as well, artists have a responsibility to look after their planet. Because if they don't, this is, these are trees planted root up, by the way, in concrete. If we don't look after the planet, where the hell is our inspiration going to come from? And that was such a moving and powerful message to us because it also reinforced um, the new, um, we're just redoing a lot of our work, what we call Ted's Conscience um, in, the, in the business. And we're looking at this whole business with respect to the world. And we break it down into three things, people, product, and planet. And so, independently of Gustav Metzger saying this, he's one of the earliest global warming um, sort of prophets in the 1960s and 70s, we realized that we were on track with that. And that this person who had this extraordinary life and had left this kind of legacy, this wonderful quote, we thought, yeah, we believe that too. We do believe that. And so it reinforced something special about the business. So again, inspiration comes back from that, came from a small art gallery in Hertfordshire, and then it led us to, we, we had a look at this in an assembly, a, a lecture at work, and we looked at all of the artists and all of the people who were involved in that uh, in, in the terms of ever So, to, to conclude, um, we believe that with imagine, imagination creativity, function, design, and beauty can exist in perfect harmony. And we do believe that great design can move people um, in extraordinary ways. And I mean, a great example of that has to be the smash outs. Because I understand it's true, isn't it, that although these are functional items, people tend to buy them as works of art. Yeah. So they are beautifully produced, they are beautifully made, they're beautifully designed, and people put them on their walls because it lifts their spirits, because it makes them feel good. So it is an example of great design actually um, moving people. Sorry, David. And actually, the one that lots of people really like in this flashback is the cotton dog. The cotton dog is just here. And you may wonder, so there he is. He is a very cute dog, and you might think that all they've done is gone on the internet and had a look at pictures of cute dogs, stuck off the crown on them, and there you go. Actually, Cotton the Dog was going to be here tonight, but you know, they say don't work with children now. So, there he is. So, Cotton the Dog, who belongs to one of our directors, uh, Catherine. So, when looking for a bit of inspiration for a new pattern, Catherine was looking around at home and she thought, hold on a minute. I know, and Cotton the dog rose to fame. He doesn't know how famous he is, but he's in bathrooms and kitchens all over the country. So it just reinforces the, the point that we always make. Inspiration can come from the most unexpected places. You just gotta kind of keep your eyes open and you've got a trawl for it and you've got to work hard at it. Thank you very much indeed.